Welcome to the Lesbian Review Podcast. I'm Sheena and I'm joined today by Mary Dean Brooks, author, ally and founder of OZUP. Mary, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. The reason I have you on today is because a little while ago I was chatting to Lee Winter about fan fiction and how important it is as a cultural space for lesbians. And she started talking about a time when you basically stood up for the people who were shipping Zena and Gabrielle. And she said that that made such a huge difference to her in her world. She suddenly felt that there were allies outside of the LGBT community. And so I got talking to you and I thought, okay, well, let's get you on here because you're actually quite a big player in the lesbian sector. You're an author, you have this website, you are a big ally. Okay, so let's talk about all of that stuff today. But let's start with the easy stuff. So you have three lesbian fiction novels that you want to recommend. Oh, yeah. Let's start with Lee Winter, The Red Files. When she told me that she was doing, uh, she was writing uh, her first novel, I thought, wow, this is going to be awesome because Lee's writing is really, really, really good. So I was really looking forward to it and I wasn't disappointed by that. It's one of my favourite novels. For those who don't know what The Red Files is about, can you tell us a little bit about it? Okay. It's a political mystery with a uh, lesbian ad angle, of course. It's a slow burn romance. And I think, it, like, if you're hoping that two characters are going to jump into bed, you're going to, at the first or second page, you're going to be disappointed because they don't. Because it is really a build-up to, and the story is so good, that you're hoping these two get together and, and do it uh, quickly, but Lee doesn't do that. What I love about the characters also, they're fleshed out and they're, superb and and one is such a cranky old can I say it bitch and I loved it I loved it I loved it and I read it to review it I started rereading it right after I finished so I absolutely loved the book I think Lee Winter's writing tends to be much more mainstream than a lot of lesbian fiction authors, and I really appreciate that about her writing. I think also it can probably cross over much easier than a lot of other lesbian can. Oh, absolutely. I had a note uh, to myself um, about this because we're going to discuss it. The note says, The mark of a great writer is to take you on a journey, and by the last page you are satisfied that you've just spent hours immersed in a world you've thoroughly enjoyed visiting. And when you've done it, you go back to the first page because you want to redo it and reread it and enjoy the, the dialogue and enjoy everything about it. That's the mark of a good book. Absolutely. I knew I would enjoy Lee's uh, writing. I was absolutely certain I would, but I wasn't expecting The Red Files. That was her first novel. And as the first novel go, it is absolutely brilliant I loved it and I told her so immediately afterwards the mark of a good writer is to make you feel to to bring you in into their journey and make you feel whatever whether it makes you feel disgusted by what's going on or thrilled by what's going on or anxious or suspenseful the idea is to make you feel to make you not want to throw the book across the room because you're, 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 it's terrible. And you've gone, oh, my God, I've just spent X amount of dollars on, on this book. No. The secret is make the reader feel and make them want to voice their opinion about it. Hint to readers, please review uh, books because it's so important. But that... It has a visceral reaction to uh, to Lee's writing in particular. It's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Let's, let's talk for a minute about why it's important for authors to get reviews from readers. Okay. Say uh, there's a, a new uh, writer and nobody knows about them except their friends and their family and they publish a book. They've spent countless hours. They've spent hours upon hours upon hours writing this thing rereading, proofing, blah, blah. And then they have the courage to post it. And then they wait 
and they hope that somebody would actually like this book. If they don't get reviews, they wonder, is anybody reading this? And they see it, that people are buying it. Okay, so do they like it? Do they don't like it? Why aren't they reviewing it? And that's important. Coming from a reader point of view, I would like to review, say, The Red Files. Okay? And I did. But I'm also coming from the author side where I feel it's important to review that book because if you don't, you don't give credit to the author. And even if you didn't like it, you can still write a review and be constructive about it. Constructive criticism about the book. Why you didn't like it? Where did you think it failed? Where did you think it didn't fail? Because no book, no book ever fails on everything. Maybe you need a stronger dialogue. Maybe you need a stronger narration. Maybe the typos were uh, too many. There's still something about a book that is good. If you don't like it, if you want to give three stars or find something good in that book too, in addition to what you didn't like. That's my take on it. Okay. Not everybody's going to get find... five stars. No. I find it very interesting talking to people about reviews because it's such a polarizing topic. You get some people who believe that you should review all books, including the ones you didn't like, and be very critical of those. And then you get others who believe you should only celebrate the books that you enjoyed, um, especially in such a small community. But you're right. Even if it has nothing to do with sales, it is feedback for the author. Um, but in terms of sales, if you get a certain number of reviews on Amazon, for example, it'll start showing you to other potential readers. So that's how it helps with sales. Yeah, it's important. Now, getting back to your original question about fanfic, the feedback that the, uh, the writer got actually made them better writers. So once they got the feedback from beta readers and everybody else, it made them better writers because the beta reader would say, okay, at this point, I didn't hear the characters in my head, so you need to rewrite that, that section. Or that doesn't make any sense. Can you add a further scene? And the constructive criticism actually help the writer because there's so many writers that came out of the fandom and they wrote mainstream now and became authors in their own right out of fanfic because it is such a hotbed of great writing that could progress and that was the whole idea of uh, fanfic. I remember some Star Trek when I was in Star Trek fandom. The writers there were phenomenal, sometimes better than the actual episodes. Fanfic is a good stepping stone and you need beta readers, you need feedback. So you would recommend that people start off in fanfic before they publish? Not necessarily fanfic. Uh, there are places online that you can publish your work and get feedback from it. But I think a fandom is, I, th I would say fandom is a great place to learn how to write because it is so easy for you because the characters have already been formed. They have a canon. All you have to do is write the story. You don't have to create a new world. You don't have to create new characters. They're there. So that's what makes uh, fandom such an easy place to write in and fanfic because it's already there and you don't have to think of anything else. You can think of a storyline, take those characters and then let them do what they normally do. All right, so what's your second recommendation? Oh, it's one of my favourites. Ice Hole by Kira Delacruz. Have you read Ice Hole? I haven't. It is brilliant. Let's see, it's a romance uh, slash supernatural humour and fantastic characters. It's one of my favourite novels ever. Uh, it's just, it's intense, but it breaks up the intensity. It's set in the, um, in the Antarctic. Hmm. Uh, on a US government base. He breaks up the intensity with humour and the humour is just phenomenal. I can't hear the, uh, the song Mighty Quinn without actually thinking of this book because if I, if I say it, I'll spoil it, but their characters are fleshed out. They're really good. 
and they're very real. They've got distinct personalities and the supernatural elements to it. It's written superbly. It will grab you and never let go until the last page. It is beyond fantastic. It is truly a wonderful book and it's not available on Kindle. It's only available on, uh, uh, on paperback if you can find it. And I've managed to grab a few copies. I did a search online and grabbed a few copies for my upcoming charity auction because I know this book is sought after by a lot of people. And it's a real shame that uh, Kira hasn't republished this. It's one of those books where after you finished it, you're going, oh, that was so good. That's my second, uh, that's the second book. Have you contacted her and said to her, republish? Well, uh, many moons ago, Kira gave me Icehold to post on, uh, on Aussie as a fanfic. Okay. And then she, and then she published it in uh, print. Okay. I can't get a hold of Kira at the moment. Okay. I don't know where she is or where she's gone, but if you're listening, publish this book. It's sad for me when this happens with books because I've got one or two also that I'm just like in love with, but you can also only find kind of secondhand copies of the book now because yes. it's not in print anymore. Okay, what is book number three? Book number three, uh, oh, it's an oldie and a real goodie because I love political stuff. Madam President by uh, Blaine Cooper and T. Noven. Again, like Lee Winter, this is a slow burn. I like my uh, stories, the stuff that I read to have substance. I don't want to read Two Girls in a Sack by the second uh, page. I want the writer to introduce me to the characters, to make me fall in love with them, to support them in their journey throughout the book. And then by the end of the book, I want to sit up and clap because <laughs> the writer has given me two or three hours of joy. And Madam President does that. I wish people could see your face when you talk about books. You just light up. you like glowing. It's wonderful. Oh, I just love good writing. I love it. I remember once being in bed and I was reading and it was so good. I actually sat up and clapped. And nobody was around to hear it except me. Maybe I'm weird. I enjoyed it to the point of going, oh, man, this is fantastic. I have to tell the author. And I got onto uh, Facebook and told her. I like telling the authors what I'm reading if I'm reading their book. I remember I was sitting in the, uh, in the doctor's office taking my mum to a, uh, an appointment. And while she was doing her thing, I was outside. And I was reading this book. And I try and second guess the author and what the author is going to do. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I know where this is going. And then the author does something totally different. I've got this iPad in, in my hand and go, no, you did not do that. I actually wrote to the author and said, you killed so-and-so. How could you? So anyway, it was, I, I'm getting a little too excited now. But anyway, yeah. That's wonderful. I love reading uh, good books. Okay, so this segues nicely into the fact that you're an author. Yes. So you have written and published how many books now? There's a lot. <sighs> I think I, my number eight is coming up uh, on the 31st of July. That's going live on the 31st. Yeah, eight. And it's all part of the same series. Yeah, I can't shut up. So tell me a bit about the first book in the series. If people have not read your books before, this is an introduction to them. In the Blood of the Greeks takes place in uh, 1942 in German-occupied Greece. It's a story about the resistance and helping Jews escape from Greece against the Germans and the Italians, mainly the Germans. One of the characters is Zoe uh, Lambros. She's, she's 13 when we are introduced to the book. And she is a Greek villager. And the other main character is Eva uh, Muller, who is the daughter of the German commander, who has undergone aversion treatment and basically is pretty damaged soul, especially if you've gone undergone all that torture for being a lesbian. That's their story, how they work together, or they hate each other, but they work together to help Jews escape. And in the course of that time, 
they find that a friendship forms and it's a slow burn. Boy, is it a slow burn. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah. And then the rest of the series, does it follow them as well or does it introduce new characters? Yes, it does. Oh, it introduces other characters, but the series mainly centers on them. Yeah. So if people like slow burn, historical, wartime novels, this will work for them. Absolutely. Please. Yes. But it goes from the first book, which is set during the war. Then it goes on to a refugee's experience of going to Australia and the, the problems they have in finding where to fit into that society. That's the second book. And then it just kind of progresses from there. Okay, so go go check it out. It's called In the Blood of the Greeks. Yep, which is taken from the national anthem of Greece. And part of uh, the national anthem says, uh, and their raiment was dyed in the blood of the Greeks. And I, I initially saw it and I thought, Damn, that's a good title for a book. So it's all about survival. It's all about how two people can work together and how the unsung heroes of World War II was women who are resisted and who are never spoken about and don't get the accolades that the, men's do, the men do. Oh, that's the truth. Yeah. You are a... I'm, I'm guessing you're a giant Cena fan. And, and you I'm, could. I'm guessing that if you... <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a giant Cena fan, yes. A little bit. Okay, because okay, you... St- Ozip. 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 Yes, Ozip. What do you think it stands for? <laughs> uh, I have no idea. I'm, I'm going to guess Australia Zena something. Information page. Ah, Okay. Because it was only supposed to be for one page. Literally, one page. And it's kind of evolved since then. It's a bloody monster. It was only supposed to be for my artwork. I have to start from the beginning with this thing. A friend of mine told me that I needed to see a show called Xena. And I said, no, absolutely not. I've got, I'm too busy with Major Kira on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Because I was writing fanfic for uh, Deep Space Nine. Back then, it was the fanzines rather than online, you know. So I was deeply involved in that. And I thought, no, I can't handle another show. She goes, you have to watch it. You have to. I go, no. Anyway, so I sat down to tape an episode for her. And I wasn't really paying attention to the screen. And then the music started. And then I thought, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, I'm about to turn it off. And I look up. And there she's hiding her weapons and I'm thinking, hello, what's this? And then uh, she comes out in her uh, underwear and, uh, and I'm thinking, hello, what's this? And then I started watching and by half an hour later, I'm thinking of episode montages in my head because I was doing art for uh, each episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And I thought, no, this will make a great episode montage. I think I'm going to do that. So I was hooked. And I went online. I found Tom's uh, Xena page, which was the Ozip of the time. And I thought, no, don't want to recreate the wheel. So let's do one page and just have my art there. And I'm thinking, yeah, okay, this will work. Yeah. Start small, stay small. Yeah, no. People started writing me in and uh, sending me photos and sending me fanfic and and oh, it just grew and grew and grew and there was no plan to it. It just grew. It's a bloody monster. So, um, yeah, that's how Ozzy started. I invited writers to get hosted on the site and I encouraged them with like Zippy Awards, basically fanfic awards, the only thing you got was a great little icon or a little image saying you won a zippy. I was cheap. I didn't have anything. Talk about great fanfic. Oh, my God. It was phenomenal. And that's how it started. And one thing led to another and it grew and grew and grew. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. It just grew. And people enjoyed it. And I enjoyed it. My reason for doing it, was rather personal and my uh, way of escaping that section of my life 
and I didn't realize what it meant to others until I actually went to a convention and people were thanking me for it and I'm thinking good god what's happening here it's one of my favorite things in the world so even uh, however many years after Zena's off the air now yeah 22 23 something like that yeah and it's still this this massive thing and Zena is still this massive has this following yeah well the fandom has raised nearly I think at the last figure was nearly 15 million for charity and uh with my auctions I think we're up to 185,000 so they got big hearts big hearts deep pockets and you know what they don't care that he, he may be a scribble on a piece of paper. Oh, this is my favourite story. I once had a Coke bottle with Lucy's name on it, just Lucy on it. And so I think he went for $500 because she autographed it. And I thought, that's silly. Do these people know it's a Coke bottle? And, but you know what? Uh, they knew what it was. It's just a good excuse to spend money for a good cause. So how much time do you spend on it still? Oh, Hours, <laughs> <laughs> hours upon hours, because I've added girl power sites. Sites, uh, in addition to Xena, I, I've expanded it to include uh, uh, Winona Earp, Supergirl, and a whole bunch of others. And, you know, I'm a glutton for punishment. What can I say? I just love it. I love what it does. It gives me joy. And that's the one thing that people need to remember. You have to do something that gives you joy. Because if you don't, why are you doing it? It's like with anything. If you write or if you review or if you uh, cycle or if you climb mountains, you do it for the love of it. It's absolutely true. And if you go into it thinking that you're going to make a whole lot of money, that's not the joy of it. That's a side benefit. It's the joy. Ozip doesn't make money. I want the support, yes. Come and visit, absolutely. But I don't want to take people's money. So how long have you been writing for? How many years? Since I was eight years old. Okay, so for a while. Uh, for a while. I'm 53. Yeah, for a while. I started writing fanfic, actually. Six million dollar man fanfic. I thought I could do better than the writers. I knew everything at eight. Anyway... And what is the most important lesson or tip that you want to share with other authors or potential authors? Do it for the love of it. Create characters that you want to read, that you want to be energized, that will grab you and not let go. Because once you create those characters, other people will feel the same way. And then create a storyline that just excites you and excites other people. But write for yourself. Write the story you want to tell. Be passionate about it. Because with no passion, you, eh, is, eh, what's left? Nothing. A passion also will drive you through those times when it's difficult, when you're not getting the responses or reviews that you thought you would get. If you do it because you're so passionate about it, you just can't not do it, you will keep going. Yes, because the story appeals to you. And you're going to find that if you write for yourself, Right, or you write for your passion. There are other people who also have an equal passion. Now, I started writing this in my uh, first book, thinking it was a Xena Yuba, which for those listening who don't know what that is, it's Xena and Gabrielle, but in a different timeline and different characters, but retaining the essence of those characters. But after the first and second page, I didn't get, I couldn't hear um, Xena and Gab in my head. And the characters just wanted to be their own characters. So that's what happened. You have to have a passion for telling the story that you want to tell. For me, my passion is telling about uh, or retelling the, the stories of women through history who have resisted and who have triumphed. Like my uh, current book, Mabel of the Anzacs, it's a story about World War I nurses who were brave who were courageous, but you never hear about it. You only heard about the men who were brave and courageous. And But on doing research, I was actually telling Lee Winter this, that uh, one of the nurses I was researching 
when the bombs were dropping on uh, the World War I uh, version of MASH, she went out of her tent. The bomb exploded, ripping, like, her back. You know what she did? She went out and tried to help her patients with fragments of the bomb in her. I was absolutely gobsmacked. It was the most courageous thing I've read. And then another nurse who tried to save her doctor with bits of shrapnel of the bomb embedded in her skull. That's courage. That is what true courage means. I'm getting excited. I need to settle down. <laughs> the women in history we don't hear about. And, and I wanted to bring that to light. So I'm passionate about that. Uh, Mabel is set in my uh, timeline in my book series with the same characters, but this time focused on the relationship between Eva and Zoe is paramount. And you see it in this book, but uh, the relationship between 18-year-old Zoe and 80-year-old Mabel is the core of the, uh, of the story. And, and how... Zoe being a uh, World War II resistance uh, fighter and Mabel being a World War I nurse who did her own version of resistance, how those two have a, a, uh, like a kindred spirit type thing. That sounds cool. Thank you. So you are an ally to the LGBT community. Yes. One of the incidents that uh, Lee spoke about was that you actually stood up for people who were shipping Zena and Gabrielle and they were getting... A lot of flack online yes so let's talk about that you are very involved in the lesbian fiction sector yes how did this all come about why are you an ally basically <laughs> the question should be why shouldn't i be an ally the question is if my friend is being discriminated against or if somebody is being discriminated against they need somebody to stand up for them they need somebody to say, oi, stop that. The question is, why not? The first person who came out to me, uh, I used to, before the internet, there was pen pals and I had a pen pal in the US and uh, we would write long rambling letters. It was epic novels. And I remember this one time she wrote to me as usual and right at the end of this epic uh, letter was, by the way, I'm a lesbian. And she expressed herself how she feels. And I got this letter and I'm responding to it as I'm reading it along. And I come to the end and I'm going, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? And I remember writing, writing back to her and going, by the way, I've got brown eyes. What do you want me to say to it? I accept you for who you are. Except it's, it's not tolerance. It's acceptance. I accept you for who you are. And she came back to me straight away. She goes, I was sweating on the fact that you were, I was hoping to hear from you soon. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, wow, okay. Can we talk about what we were talking about before? It's basically, the, the question for me is, is I would be negligent as a friend if I didn't support my friends who happen to be gay. It's negligence. It doesn't offend me. I'm a Christian. It doesn't offend me in any shape or form. I will accept somebody for who they are until you prove to me you're a total idiot. And then be gone. <laughs> but unless you prove to me you're not worthy of my attention, no, I will accept you for who you are. It's just the way it is. And do you receive that sort of acceptance in return for your books in the sector? Because I know that there are some people who are like, oh, no, I can't possibly read something written by a straight person. Actually, a lot of people don't think I'm straight. Oh, my God, I just doubted myself. <laughs> there you go you heard it first no um i don't know nobody has ever said that to me uh nobody has ever said that's not right somebody did um 
they they didn't accept the fact that uh, now, yeah, they didn't accept the fact that I would write uh, I would write fiction for their people, and I wouldn't have an idea of what it's like. I'm quite sure nobody has ever said to Patricia Cornwall, "You can't write a straight the character because you don't know what it's like." Or Kathy Wright, or uh, or any of the other authors. Well, this is the thing. My response when people say this to me is, I'm pretty sure Tolkien wasn't a hobbit. I'm pretty sure J.K. Rowling is not actually a wizard. Mm-hmm. And you don't know anything about dragons, so... Exactly. Uh, that's that's what a writer does. It, it, it plucks stuff out of your imagination and just goes with it. I don't have to experience a version uh, torture to know what it is and how to write about it, but I do know what, uh, how a loving person can react. And it's the same whether it's uh, male or female. I actually write better females than males, I think. And um, I don't know why, but there you go. Sometimes male authors prefer to write female characters. Sometimes female authors prefer to write male characters. Who knows? It's the complexity of being a human. People shouldn't get hung up about who the author is, but who the characters are. If the characters speak to you, then the, re- the writer has done a good job. If the character just inspires you, you're not thinking about the writer. You're thinking about the character. You don't care whether he had his cornflakes in the morning, where he went to school or what he did yesterday. You don't care. But I do care about the characters to the point where if the character, like as I was saying at the doctor's office, I got so involved in the story that I couldn't believe this this author did what she did. I was outraged. But, uh, yeah, she did a great job. Um, Yeah, so it doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. But having said that, I'm not in a position to, I have never been discriminated based on my gender or who I loved or who I didn't love. So I'm not, I don't know, coming from that point of view, they may have a point, but I think it's all about the characters rather than the author. I agree with you. I also think that as part of a minority, lesbians get discriminated against all the time. So we know what it's like. So how can we turn around and discriminate against others? It just doesn't make any sense to me. We should be celebrating our allies and and our community and accept any kind of acceptance we get. I think it has something to do, if I equate that with something that I've been working on recently, and that is collaborators during World War II, how they can turn against their own people and and turn against them, right? I would say that their interest lies in what they think they can get out of it or this. maybe they hate themselves for being who they are. I haven't been in that position, so I, I'm talking out of my uh, out of the top of my hat to go against somebody that is exactly like you. I don't understand it either. I can't fathom how somebody can do it. Mary, thank you so much for joining me today. Where can people find you and your books online? Okay, uh, next chapter or one word dot net is my uh, author site. Ozip dot com a u s x i p Dot com is my monster site. I'm on Twitter on Ozip Mary D and uh, Mary D Brooks Fick for my Twitter, my author thing. And Facebook, Ozip Mary D. You've been listening to the Lesbian Review Podcast. I'm Sheena and I've been joined today by Mary D Brooks. If you've enjoyed this podcast and come talk to us on the Lesbian Talk Show chat group on Facebook, you can email us on podcast at thelesbiantalkshow.com or follow us on Twitter at Lesbian Talk Show. You can also join our community of patrons and get exclusive content. You can go to patreon.com slash the lesbian talk show. The link is in the show notes. And one of the exclusive podcasts that our patrons are going to get is a mini interview with Mary D. Brooks. Five questions in five minutes. She doesn't know what the questions are. She's not prepared for this one. And I ask her something really difficult. That's all for this week. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.